For those of you who are interested in my talk because you want to know about how to argue with the cops or with your boss or with your parole officer, I'm sorry, my talk just isn't for you. Or rather, my talk isn't just for you, it's for everybody. Because although I hope that most, okay, all of us don't ingest uh, legally controlled substances, every day we all ingest things that could be considered toxins or maybe considered drugs. It depends on how you define a drug. So how do you define a drug? When we, like a when we want a definition, we often go to the dictionary. And the dictionary defines a drug as a substance that has a physiological effect when ingested or otherwise introduced to the body. But that doesn't seem like a great definition. How's that different from a food? A food has a physiological effect when ingested. So I teach a class here in, at Utah Valley University in pharmacology, and we have a textbook that, of course, has a definition of a drug. Now, the textbook's definition is a little bit more involved than the dictionary definition, but you'd hope that maybe it's a better definition as well. The textbook defines a drug as a molecule that interacts with the body in a physiological way that's called the drug receptor model. At least that's what the textbook says. But then later in the same chapter, there's a section that says uh, that there are drugs that don't fit the drug receptor model. So the textbook is in itself admitting that its own definition is incomplete. So we still are on that hunt for that perfect definition of a drug. What about legal definitions? Drugs are regulated, right? So the law must contain a definition of a drug, and it does. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act defines a drug as something intended for use in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease. And it stipulates that it's other than food. Now this definition may or may not be helpful. The bottom line is we still don't have a completely adequate definition of what is and what is not a drug. But no matter what the definition of drugs is, there's one thing that I do know with complete confidence about them. Drugs are toxic. Well, how do I know that? Especially if I'm not sure what the definition of drugs is. Well, I know that because everything is toxic. You might think that I'm trying to be facetious here, but actually, I mean it. Everything is toxic or in, uh, to varying amounts, or rather, varying amounts of everything is toxic. And this idea was first published about 500 years ago by the Swiss alchemist and physician Paracelsus. He said, everything is poison. There's nothing that isn't poison. Only the right dose differentiates a poison from a cure. So was Paracelsus right? Well, I think you could say that he was half right and that the half that he got right was that everything indeed is poison or toxic. This fact can actually be uh, most easily demonstrated with the example of water. Water is the most abundant chemical in every living thing, including you and I. Our bodies are about 70% water by mass, but water is actually toxic to us if we get too much of it. The toxicity of water was actually, unfortunately, seen right here in Orem, Utah a few years ago when a little girl died as the result of being forced to drink too much water. Another sad example was the California woman who was competing in a radio show stunt to see how long she could go without going, at being induced to drink copious amounts of water to try to get her to succumb and run to the ladies' room. Well, she did succumb, dying of water toxicity. So even water is toxic in the wrong amount. Everything is toxic if we get too much of it. Too much salt, toxic. Too much sugar, toxic. Too much of the essential amino acid lysine, toxic. But, if you, uh, but you might ask, if everything is toxic, how can Plato say on his label that it's not toxic? The answer is that the government simply hasn't defined uh, how to meet the definition of non-toxic, that's not regulated. And yes, too much Play-Doh is actually toxic. Even water is toxic. Everything is toxic in too large amounts. Paracelsus was right about that. But it was the other half of what I told you he said in which he was wrong. He said that at the right dose, everything could be a cure. But it's not true that everything has what we would call a useful dose. And there are two kinds of usefulness that we can talk about here. One kind of usefulness is nutritional usefulness. Too much water is toxic 
but you need enough water because of its nutritional usefulness. Too much salt, toxic, but you need enough salt. Too much of the essential amino acid lysine is toxic, but you need enough life lysine. If you don't get enough of one of these nutritional substances, a nutrient, then you suffer what's called a deficiency disease. Nutritional usefulness includes staving off deficiency disease. The other type of usefulness that ingested substances can have is called therapeutic usefulness. Therapeutic usefulness means medicines that can be used to fight other types of disease other than deficiency disease. These are the kinds of things that we might think of as drugs. Food have, foods have useful doses, nutritional doses, and drugs have useful doses, therapeutic doses, but they also have toxic doses, doses that can cause damage including side effects. So now let's look at some examples of things that all of us would probably agree are drugs. Uh, first, we'll look at some of the most widely used drugs, simple over-the-counter painkillers. Since before recorded history, a natural compound that's particularly abundant in the bark of willow saplings has been used to treat fever and pain. And this compound was identified in 1829 as salicylic acid or salicylate. Salicylate, a natural painkiller from willow bark and other plants, is reasonably effective and is still used some, but it has some lousy side effects, including significant negative impact on the stomach. So in 1897, a chemist at the Bayer Chemical Company in Germany decided to chemically modify salicylate to try to improve it, and he made a derivative called acetyl salicylic acid that we now know as aspirin. Aspirin is actually a more effective painkiller than salicylate, the natural compound that it's made from. And it has less obnoxious side effects, but it does have side effects. A more recently invented painkiller and fever reducer that has even fewer side effects is the completely synthetic compound acetaminophen. It's because of acetaminophen's fewer side effects that this compound is the painkiller and fever reducer of choice in hospitals. Now, the all-natural salicylate, the semi-synthetic aspirin, and the completely synthetic acetaminophen, they're all three toxic pretty badly toxic at the wrong doses, but all three are also definitely therapeutically useful. Now let's consider another natural drug and some synthetic drugs that it inspired. The natural drug is a potently active compound from a medicinal herb that's been used for hundreds of years by various Native American peoples to treat a variety of maladies. The medicinal herb is the coca plant, and this compound is cocaine. Cocaine affects the neurotransmitter transporters in the presynaptic cells in your brain, and that's the basis of its powerful addictive effect. But cocaine also affects the voltage-dependent sodium channels in nerves, including peripheral nerves, and when it blocks these channels, the result is a very effective local anesthesia. And cocaine has been used as a decent local anesthetic, but one with some fairly dangerous side effects. In light of the serious side effects of cocaine, this natural local anesthetic, pharmaceutical chemists began synthesizing compounds that were inspired by it. Now, don't read too much into my saying that these were inspired by cocaine. <laughs> these are synthetic compounds called the cane drugs, and you've probably had a cane drug administered to you, like Novocaine or Lidocaine. Every major dental procedure or suture stitch that I've had, I've praised those blessed pharmaceutical chemists that invented the cane drugs. And Novocaine doesn't have anywhere near the terrible side effects of cocaine. But is Novocaine toxic? Of course it is. However, it is because of its wonderful therapeutic usefulness that I praise the hallowed, blessed, Latinate, cocaine-inspired name of Novocaine. Now allow me one more example, the dermatologic drug isotretinoin a brand name of which is Rocutane. Is Rocutane a natural compound or a synthetic creation of pharmaceutical chemists? Well, it's found in nature, in fact, found in all of us. In fact, required by all of us because it's actually a vitamin. Isotretinoin is a form of vitamin A. Vitamin A serves a number of different nutritional purposes. It serves as the chromophore to enable us to see. It serves as a natural antioxidant. I wish we had the time to talk about natural antioxidants, but that's a whole other talk. 
uh, it has the role of a hormone that's particularly important in cellular development. If you don't get enough vitamin A, then you will get one uh, deficiency disease or another from night blindness to actually unpleasant death. So vitamin A definitely has nutritional usefulness, but it also has therapeutic usefulness. Isotretinoin is a very effective drug for treating some dermatologic conditions, including severe cystic acne and ichthyosis, even life-threatening ichthyosis. Such a wonderfully uh, powerful compound with both nutritional usefulness and therapeutic usefulness must be nothing but good, right? No. Vitamin A is devastatingly toxic at the wrong doses. It can not only cause very vexing side effects to the overdose patient, but it can cause tragic birth defects if she happens to be pregnant due to too much activation of the natural hormone receptor. All drugs, even drugs that are not only based on natural vitamins, but that simply are higher doses of, low, of natural uh, vitamins, they can be toxic. And that effect, that toxic effect doesn't depend on how we define them. Now, some people are quick to criticize things that most of us would agree should be called drugs and insist that there are alternatives that they say are not drugs. They call them di natural dietary supplements. And they say that not only are these dietary supplements not drugs, but that they are superior to drugs. I remember reading in a local newspaper article about the prevalence of the dietary supplement industry here in the state of Utah, where a woman that ran a supplement shop was quoted as saying that supplements, quote, are foods. There are no side effects from using them. Can that be true? Can there be substances that have not only nutritional usefulness, but therapeutic usefulness, and yet don't have side effects? Well, consider vitamin A. Vitamin A is certainly by anyone's definition a natural dietary supplement, but it also very clearly has side effects, even life-threatening side effects. Basically, if something has effects, then it will have side effects. And if it doesn't have effects, it will still have side effects. Remember Paracelsus? And he was right. Everything has side effects, everything's toxic. And we've never found any substance that is an exception to that rule, not even water. Okay, so what's the difference between a drug and a supplement then? Well, that might be my biggest point. There's some very important ambiguity here. It can really be argued that nobody has a perfect definition of what is and what is not a drug or where we should draw any line between drugs and supplements. Perhaps it could be argued that supplements are substances that have nutritional usefulness and drugs are substances that have therapeutic usefulness. But if supplements only have nutritional usefulness, then they can only be used to treat deficiency diseases. So uh, herbal substances, well, like cocaine that has no, nutrition, no nutritional usefulness but does have therapeutic usefulness, well, that would have to be categorized as a drug and not a dietary supplement. I imagine that most of us are happy to categorize cocaine as a drug, but we'd also have to ca uh, categorize the salicylate in our willow tea, uh, willow bark tea as a drug and not a dietary supplement. And what about vitamin A, which has both nutritional usefulness and therapeutic usefulness? Is that a drug or a dietary supplement? or both. The third definition that I offered near the beginning of my talk was the legal definition. And legally, drugs and dietary supplements are categorized separately. They're regulated differently. Drugs have to go through extensive animal testing and even more intensive human clinical trials in order to prove their safety and their efficacy. And that testing includes delineating the doses that are useful therapeutically and doses that are toxic. By the way, 92% of drugs that go into human clinical trials don't pass them. And we never have to worry about buying those things because they're proven to be ineffective or unsafe or both. However, dietary supplements are actually assumed to be safe unless proven otherwise. They're not tested for dosing or for efficacy. In fact, no testing of any kind beyond what is required for foods actually has to be done in order to bring a dietary supplement to the market. But they do have to be honestly labeled in, in the case of any health claims that they make. So, there are, so are there dietary supplements that are useful for therapeutic and not just nutritional purposes? Absolutely there are, and not just vitamin A, which is actually labeled as a drug, marketed as a drug, but look at salicylate, the active component of willow tea, or look at some powerful medicinal herbs like coca, tobacco, marijuana, and opium poppies, and the compounds like cocaine, nicotine, cannabinol, and morphine that come from them. But aren't those drugs? 
Well, that's really the question that I've been talking about. And when it comes to trying to give an absolutely clear definition, an absolutely clear answer to that question, no one really knows such incontrovertible answer. It's an oversimplification to categorize drugs and dietary supplements as totally different things that don't have anything to do with each other, when in fact there's no clear bright line between them. Now I'm certainly not trying to suggest that there are not useful and valuable dietary, uh, natural dietary supplements. There are. Nor am I trying to suggest that uh, dietary supplements should be regulated just as drugs are. What I am trying to suggest is that you and I, as consumers, should be more educated. We should be aware that the things that are legally classified as dietary supplements have not been tested, as have the things that are legally classified as drugs. Not tested for dosages, not tested for effectiveness, not tested for safety. And that if they have therapeutic value, then they're really a lot more like drugs than we might want to admit and testing would probably be a good idea. Also, they are just as likely as drugs to have negative side effects, especially at concentrations, at dosages that have therapeutic effects. So we'd probably benefit from doing at least some testing. So imagine, imagine with me a world in which more people understand how hard it is to actually define what is and what isn't a drug. Imagine a world in which more of us consumers are actually edu more educated about both drugs and dietary supplements. Well, now you're more educated, and now you can help spread the word. Thank you.